You just don't know. Right, yeah, someone got it for me. Thank you. Hello, droid and droidettes of Turkey. It's absolutely excellent to be in Turkey today and see all the enthusiasm behind Android development at this first big Android event in Turkey. I'm going to do a few slides on creating outstanding Android applications. It's probably the widest ranging title I could come up with, so you have no idea what the talk will actually be about. But as, uh, as is clear, I'm going to do it in English, so if I start speaking too fast, just look at me like with a blank expression or something and I'll try and slow it down. Just shake your head and sort of be like, what the hell is he saying? Let me just open this bottle of water up as well. So I always start these talks with a little bit on the Android ecosystem and where we've got to so far. So who's been following, who's been keeping up with the, the Android numbers recently? Can anyone fill in the top blank on this page? Does anyone know how many million devices have been activated now? How many? 700. 3, 3 million? Higher. Uh, anyone? 600 million? No, it's lower than that, unfortunately. Sorry. We haven't got that yet. So, who said 300? There you go. Catch. <laughs> I'm a bad thrower. He's probably a fine catcher. 300 million devices activated now. 850,000 activations a day. You've seen these figures before. But this time, when I was writing this talk, I started looking at the number of total app downloads. 15 billion app installs. And it was only last October or November that we announced that there were 10 billion app installs. So I was looking at that and I thought, we're now shipping over a billion applications a month out of the Android uh, that we can place as it is these days. And similar stores are probably doing the same. And if you look at the numbers behind that, some crazy back of a napkin maths, will uh, imply that that's over a petabyte of applications a month going out to developers, uh, to users' handsets. And that's like, I think it's 15 zeros on the end of that. It's just an enormous number. So how can you be part of that? How can you succeed on Android through creativity and innovation? I guess the statement almost answers itself. But succeeding on Android through creativity and innovation. If we look back to when Ice Cream Sandwich came out, it came out with these principles behind it. The principles of beautiful, simple, and smart. And these aren't just for us, these are principles that you can use for your own applications as well. When you're developing Android applications, you use these, these, uh, these goals, the aspirational goals, to really think about your application and make it a top tier application on Android, an application that's going to be competitive in that marketplace with all those downloads. We've got a site that you can look at, at developer.android.com slash design. Who's been to developer.android.com slash design? Hey, excellent, absolutely excellent. Since it came out, it's made my life a lot easier. I don't have to keep telling people not to put borders around their buttons and use iOS designs on Android, that kind of thing. There's one specific page called Pure Android that I use absolutely all the time. So this site will help with those designs. Main principles, designed for the latest version of Android, but great, really great. Design for tablets and phones. And be innovative. And as you're looking through the site, you see the design now has buttons without borders. We have grids without grid lines. We just let the content come through. You can put things over the top of the cell, but we're no longer separating the cells out. <coughs> we're not putting any extra detail onto the screen. It doesn't need to be there. We're just keeping it simple, clean, clear, and effective for the user to get to that content. The same with the system. If you don't want the navigation buttons down the side, you want to make your application more immersive, your game more immersive, you can hide those buttons away just with a simple, a simple form, just to fade away with the bar on the side. And if you're watching video content, you can get rid of it totally. So then we have the touch feedback. How to keep the user informed all the time about what's going on in your application. The worst thing is if you're application becomes not responsive, or the user believes it's not responsive because you didn't respond. And we have things in Android called stateless drawables, things like this, which make it very easy to always have good response to the user whenever they touch a button, touch anywhere on the screen. And then another part, which can really elevate your app, 
We have this thing called perceived quality. When a user's using your application and they're flinging through list views and swiping through, through view pages, it's this perceived quality in the back of their head that really makes them think it's a high quality application. And some of the Google apps we put now hero screens in there. Just little things on the front. On the YouTube app, we have this big video wall. On the music app, the carousel. And these things are just there. They're single, individual pieces of functionality to raise the perceived quality of the application to get you the extra star on the Google Play Store. We call them hero screens. In these cases, these hero screens were done in RenderScript, which uh, is a fun technology to play with, but it's not particularly well documented right now. Has anyone had a, a play with RenderScript? Nice. Someone actually, that's probably more than the average that we get in a room of people. Uh, with RenderScript. The real advantage of RenderScript is you get all the performance of the NDK, which is the native development kit that someone's got to talk on tomorrow, but you don't have to compile your binaries cross platform or per platform as you would with the NDK. With RenderScript, you get all that native uh, performance, and we put a compiler on every single device so it gets compiled uh, in install time, and then it runs super fast. So we have this massive variety of devices. This is just Samsung. All those different screen sizes, all those devices. And we work to make sure that whatever application that you write will work fine across all the devices. It'll be compatible. And for that, we have something called the Compatibility Test Suite. Have any of you ever looked into the Compatibility Test Suite? No. That's going to be my tricky one. It's available at source.android.com slash compatibility. And it's a set of 13,000 tests that has to run on every single Google experience Android device. Every single Android device with the Google Play Store on it has to pass all of these tests. And this is where the definition of fragmentation really comes in. If you say you think Android is fragmented because of different screen sizes, I would argue that's a feature of Android. That's not fragmentation. But if you say there's fragmentation on Android because you wrote a camera application and the API didn't work correctly on an HTC 7-inch device, then that is fragmentation. And that's what a compatibility test suite is there to try and stop. If you find an issue in a public API, like a camera taking a picture upside down, then we can put a new test in the test suite to make sure every new Android device that's released doesn't fall into that same category, doesn't have that same error on it. And as I say, the, the compatibility test suite is totally open. You can download it. You can run it on your own devices. 13,000 tests. I haven't looked through them all. So we work to make sure that your application is going to run on all the devices. But then, of course, it's up to you to make sure that your application looks great on all those devices. And that's a bit tricky, I think. So we can look to web development. Web designers have been doing this for years, making applications or websites that look well across, look great across a lot of different variations of screen sizes. And one of the principles they use is responsive design. So with responsive design, we can use exactly the same content and just lay it out differently on different devices to get, uh, well, to reach our goals of having that that's great across all the devices. If your designer understands responsive design, and as a developer, you understand what your designer is giving to you, you can create these modules. And you just write them once. If you know that the module on the left is going to need to uh, be wider for the tablet version, then you can just write the module once, use it on both screens. And it's the same for all the modules in the Google Play Store, the description, everything. So to get the tablet experience in the Play Store application, we're just relaying out the same stuff that's on the phone experience. So it's not really that much extra effort. We can use technology called Fragments for this, and our support library for Fragments, and all of this becomes a whole lot easier. Kind of makes sense. And um, just one example being the Gmail application, which unfortunately had to be out. One other thing, of course, a lot of people will say less is more. Think back to mobile first designs. Just keep the important navigation on the screen, the things that your users are going to really want to, to engage with inside your mobile app. Everything else they can go to the web for, but those core things inside your app are what should be there. And then if you find something that's really important, bring that out onto a home screen widget as well. We find with the home screen widgets, if you can get a user to install a home screen widget on your device, the 
engagement with your application you got will be tenfold. This day, pull the phone out of the pocket and see that home screen widget on it with your brand, your application, and that's the thing they're going to engage with instantly. And one of the metrics we use in the Google Play Store for ranking applications is how many apps, how many of your installs get uninstalled. So if you have a home screen widget and people use your app a lot, they're not going to uninstall it, you'll be further up in the rankings, other things like that. Okay, so that's more about the design. When it actually comes to the development of the application, whether you're starting out brand new on Android, or whether you're an advanced Android developer, we have developer.android.com slash training. And here we're writing lots and lots of new material every month. Here we have one of the kind of classes. Has anyone been to the, the training site? Oh, yeah. ah. Basic advanced articles, sample code, and a lot of tutorials on there as well. They have recently been updated. So the core things you'll learn on the Android training site are to keep the UI thread for the UI. That's the most important thing for perceived quality. It's the most important thing for your app engagement. Is that the UI is always responsive and snappy and swipes, swipe very quickly, but view pages track your finger perfectly. There's tutorials for all these things on the Android training site. The things in Android you'll be using to keep it snappy, uh, moving your functionality to the background with async tasks, intent services, threads and handlers, and of course, using strict mode whilst you're developing. Strict mode will tell you if you're doing anything on the UI thread that shouldn't be there. And the other thing is to use the right tools for the job. We go to tools.android.com. Recently, we've been uh, updating the Android emulators. Uh, has anyone had bad experiences with the Android emulator in the past? Has anyone had good experiences with the Android emulator? It's usually far few. Um, the latest Android emulators are so much better than they used to be. If you haven't tried them out, you haven't updated, you have to go and see them. We now have the hacks, the Intel Hardware Accelerated Execution. And um, this uses virtualization technology on your computer to make an emulator that's almost as fast as your file. It really is amazing. Uh, right now, we've only got a gingerbread version of it, but they're working on an ice cream sandwich version as well. This emulator changes everything for me when I'm um, developing Android on my device. So to get it, you need to go to your Android SDK manager and get this Intel Hardware Acceleration Execution Manager. And when you get that, all it does is download a binary which sits in the folder on your hard drive, Android SDK, Extras, Intel. So you download it and then you go to this directory and you install it. And then you download the Intel Atom x86 image. And then after that, when you create a new emulator based on the Atom x86 image, you should get a little box saying, this is hardware accelerated. The prerequisites are you need an Intel chip, and that Intel chip needs to support virtualization, which a lot of them do these days. This solves another huge problem for us. Not only does it give you faster testing, but one of the most frequent questions we get on our office hours that we do online each Wednesday, which you're welcome to come to, if you're on Google Plus, is how do I take video off my handset? How do I make product videos of my Android product? And we've said previously, you get your handset, and really, you've either got to sit there with a the camera and take a video of the handset, or you've got to get root access to the device, which a lot of people don't like doing, and then there's some hacks you can do to get the video and you know, uh, create product videos. If you have one of these emulators, however, with the hardware acceleration, they run at about the same speed as your handset. So if you've got this emulator installed, you can use it to make product videos. This was just screen capturing on a Windows box that I was doing earlier. I was kind of jittery, but it was easy to do. As you go around the application, you create the product videos. This means now every single application in the Google Play Store should have a product video. We have space for you to upload one. And if you have one, you're going to convert more of your users. I see the stats every single day for the number of visitors that have made it to an application page compared to the number of people that installed the app. And it's rarely above 90%. And sometimes, only about 30 or 40% of the people who hit that page install the application. And often that's due to, oh, this is just to show that it, um, 
plays movie content as well, let's put this out. That the, uh, the emulator is good enough to be able to play movie content as well. And this is the movie from the browser on the emulator. So the emulator can do OpenGL and it can do video playback and it's as fast as a phone now. So get your product videos made, get them uploaded to the Google Play Store, and hopefully you'll get more of the users that get to your uh, page on Google Play installing the application because they'll be more excited about it. You can highlight the best features of your application there and then. One other thing up at the tool site is called Lint. And Lint is now built into Eclipse in the latest versions. Uh, it does a whole load of stuff. Uh, for checking your application to see if it can uh, improve the efficiency of your application. It will check uh, all your layouts to see if uh, there's rules to or let me just double check. Useless parent, useless leaf, and deep layouts. It's going to check to see if you have uh, child elements with no siblings. It's going to check if you have parents with no um, siblings, or no children, sorry. And if they are, it's going to suggest ways that you can make your layouts faster on Android. And not only that, it can fix them for you as well. But one of the really neat things is if you're targeting an SDK level, say you want to target SDK 15, so your application's not running in compatibility mode, but your minimum SDK level is 8, because you want to support all the way back to gingerbread, then Lint will make sure that you're not using any API calls uh, above the minimum SDK level. So we also get this question a lot quite as well as well. If I'm targeting something above the minimum SDK, how do I make sure that it's going to work on that, that lower API level? And then it does it for you. It's actually just built in to the tools, and you'll see it appearing in your, uh, your problems at the bottom. Then you can force it in to run with a little checkbox and see all the output that Lint has. And Zap and Tor from the tools team are working on brand new rules for Lint all the time. And uh, it should hopefully improve the stability of your Android application, make your application more efficient, and make sure it's compatible with a wider range of devices. So we've got designing and we've got developing to make an outstanding Android application. The third part that we really love is to see innovation. Innovation in Android applications creates discussion. It creates discussion in amongst our editorial team, in amongst the Android communities. It could be for the good or for the bad. People might hate your innovation, they might love it, it might be design, UI innovations, it could be anything. But doing something that someone's not done before is practically free PR for your application. Love it or hate it. If people hate it, you can change it, or you can stick by your guns and get more free PR out of it. People that have innovated. Pulse, Reef 360. At some point, this uh, Pulse application, which has horizontal stack lists of views, didn't exist. And now we have Pulse and Tap2 and BBC News all using this UI paradigm. It's a really good way on mobile for having lots of different topics that you want to browse through quickly. Other applications that innovate, YouTube, quite simply uh, lets you use your phone to control the web browser, whether the web browser is on a TV, on a Google TV, somewhere else, you can just send the video to another device. It's quite simple. Just uses the internet to, to tell our service that you want to play it. We have the, the heart rate monitor, which you just put your finger over the camera and the flash, and it will Look at the shades of red moving and figure out your heart rate. And actually, it's pretty good. It works quite well. I can't imagine how many subtle red images these guys have to look at to get this working. But it does work quite well. And it's something we talk about. The same as Iron Road. They're using computer vision. You have it mounted in your car windscreen. They use computer vision to detect what else is on the road in front of you. And not only that, they'll figure out how far away it is from you and whether it's getting closer or further away. And if something comes closer quickly, it can start videoing it. Augmented reality we've seen a few times now. Foursquare, simple, but they added Android Beam. Android Beam got released with Ice Cream Sandwich, and if you put two Android 4 devices together, they can talk to each other over NFC. Android Beam is a really, really easy API to implement. It's just kind of a small piece in your manifest to say what you want to do when the devices are touched. And with Foursquare, they added it in. So if you're on a Places page, 
and you touch the phones together in the same page open as on the other one. If you're on a friend's page, you can just follow each other just by touching the phones together. It's just a nice, simple piece of innovation that makes life easier for the user. One of the most fun ones for me was the State Farm Driver Feedback. If you have a look at it and see what it does. You have it running in your car, and it's measuring all the time acceleration, braking, and cornering with G-forces uh, from the accelerometer. And it gives you a driver score at the end of it. And it tells you whether you're a good driver or a bad driver. And this is fun. You can just leave it running and see compared to all the other people in your peer group, all the other people on the, the application, how good a driver you are. And clearly the aim is to get the lowest score. So, there you go. So what are these going to Google Play? which used to be Android Market. I'm sure everyone picked up that, right? That Android Market is now Google Play Store. We switched it over, it's now our big cross-media brand, and we'll be opening uh, books and movies and music and applications in every country across Europe as we go on the lab. It's already, I think America's the only country right now with everything. We just launched movies in Italy, then books in France, something else in Germany, came out recently. So the, the media verticals are coming out in every single country. And this is going to be the place we advertise. This is going to be the thing that we really market as being the place to get everything on Android. With Android Market, we didn't really put any uh, marketing money behind it. It was there on the devices, and we hope people found it. Google Play is a very, very different proposition for us. Google Play is going to be the place that uh, you have to go for your, your movies, music, and books, as well as the applications. So all of that together, hopefully, helps us all create outstanding Android applications. Thank you very much. And now, the remaining time we can use for any questions. Uh, it doesn't just have to be about the presentation and outstanding Android apps, it can be about any part of Android, Android development, or Google Play, I guess, as well. processing expert, but you should be able to use any open source image processing libraries that there are out there. I only know ones that work around augmented reality, really. They're the only ones I've looked into. I've not looked into real computer vision libraries, but maybe somebody else in the room. Does anyone in the room know of a image processing library that's free and open source? Yeah. Open CV. You know this one already. Okay. Do you think open CV? It can't be that hard to search for open source <laughs> image processing libraries, right? They haven't been done to Google in the back of my head yet, so I'm working on it. That was the April Fool's joke. Sorry. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, you'll be able to use Android applications on our desk as portal out of question. Intel already have, or well, there's a couple of different ways you can already do it right now. Uh, if you just search on the internet, there's one. Uh, do you remember what it's called? Oh, me neither. There is one runtime which lets you run Android applications inside Windows. U Wave. Who said? U Wave. U Wave, maybe? No. But yes, and the other one is the new emulators, uh, which are much faster. But yeah, there's one actually properly designed out there to run Android apps with Windows. But it's not something you need to install it yourself, but you've got to distribute the application. And No, no, no. no, we totally still just design it for mobile devices. So the desktop is not the radar, you have to say, you also use the desktop Yeah, but that seems to fall under the Chrome kind of Chrome radar, doesn't it? I haven't heard anything about Android going after that space at all, but then the manufacturers are creating devices that run Android, like the Asus Transformer Prime really is kind of a desktop running Android, but we're still focusing on the mobile devices.
Interesting. So of course you could choose your own layout, format something like HTML layouts, <coughs> and then download them separately. But actually downloading the XML files and loading them up externally, I don't think so. Not, um, I wonder if you could build something into your application which allowed you to do it. The problem would be overriding the ones that are inside your APK. So you'd either have to rewrite the code to look for new layout files and then get those layout files in there, or somehow overwrite the ones that are inside your application. And overwriting the ones in your application would be really tricky. I just wonder if you think ahead, maybe you could build in, like if plus certain date, look for a different file, or if file exists somewhere else, maybe use that. You could look into other ways. No, I still don't know why. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe she can uh, make a layout from Ruby. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And then send the code down and run below the class. Yeah, if you don't use a layout file and you code it, then you can do remote class loading and you can send a new class down. We have um, a post on the Android developers blog about remote class loading. And you can load new Java classes. I don't know about like XML resources. So if you code it. Okay? Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, the publisher site team were updating this all the time, and then we added it in. So you can filter them, or you can see which handset and which version of the app it was reported on. Uh, the request to be able to respond to developers has been top of the list for, for quite a while now. Um, hopefully, they release something with regard to that at some point. I know that it's on their radar, and they, they'd really like to do something about it. I definitely bring it up quite a lot. Hi. Yeah, sure. Ah, in Turkey it's probably different, right? I don't think you have paid apps. Uh, you can't sell apps from inside Turkey now, right? You can buy apps, but you can't sell them? Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, that's not legal. <laughs> Unless you re-register your company in the US, which is okay. But if you just pretend to be lying and put the fake mailbox address in, that's not necessarily legal. So the only way to right now of making money from the Google Play Store in Turkey would be to use advertising, unfortunately. Until Google check out gets support for Lira inside it, and then we can roll out. What about in general? Yeah, in general, I have another 30 minute talk, which is just on this topic. But the way forward is definitely to go for free applications uh, with in-app purchases and then getting the balance right of how much of your application you give away for free before asking for a purchase is, is very tricky. But if you can get this balance just right, and people use your application, they get to love it, they really respect it, and then you ask them for some money, then you get the massive conversion rates. So it's just this balance of putting a free application out there, getting a lot of installs, and then having the, the point that you sell something to them, that you upsell them in, in about the right place. So we can talk, maybe after that, because there's a lot of details. We can go to on that. How are we for time? We okay for time? Oh, oh, cool. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. So why can't I use Maybe because the developers don't want you to. <laughs> Usually it's content licensing reasons or language reasons. Uh, you're going to get a lower rating if you launch a Turkish language app which hasn't been translated to English in England because people will install it. Um, maybe in say that's in Turkish. So if people do restrict it, we give people the option to restrict applications to any set of countries they want. Um, the BBC in England restrict their applications because they don't have the content rights or whatever to distribute outside of England for some of it. There'll be different reasons. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, she said uh, one way to differentiate is smart fragmented. Android is differentiated, not fragmented. I do, I totally agree with that. There's a whole lot of points which people believe are fragmentation that I really think are part of the Android platform um, and have been since the very beginning. Uh, the roots of it, and it's built into the platform that it should work this way. But then there is fragmentation as well. Um, some people would argue that newer releases of Android bring on fragmentation without having backwards compatibility for new features. 
maybe you can de degrade it gracefully for them. Um, for me, the only real fragmentation is when someone releases a device that gets through the compatibility test suite and it has an API error in it. That is a nightmare and it's a pain and hopefully they upgrade it soon. Um, and it has happened before and we try and stop it with every single release. It's actual anything that's not about the API spec. Sorry, the guy. Uh, the yeah, the key for those things is making sure that your application looks native on each of the platforms. If you can get to the point where you do use a cross-platform tool, but then you run it on Android, it looks like Android, the buttons are Android-y, the scrolling is Android-y, the bounce back is Android-y, and then on iOS, if it all looks iOS, then I have less problem with them. The problem is when you use a cross-platform tool and you end up with maybe something that just looks like an average mobile website, and then you put it in the store. People, you're going to get worse rates of this. So as long as you can get the native UIs, having the, the back end code the same is not for that. Mm -hmm. There's a few people who um, manage to steer away in between the iOS guidelines and the Android guidelines and maintain their own brand and release some of the apps on the platforms and that's, that's very clever when they manage that. They take bits from both without taking anything that's particularly uh, attached to either platform. And that's apparently fine too. Yeah, okay, we're out of time. Thank you all very much. And I'll be around.